14th event of global uh, to do 14th event of Global Thursday Talks, which is a digital community formed in the times of COVID-19 pandemic, when actually we realized solidarity and making connections are the center for our community. Again, it was the time when material conditions forced us, all of our presence would continue in online platforms. More than a year now, we started with Peter McLaren and then hosted here at Global Tuesday Talks, many critical pedagogues and public intellectuals like Henry Giro, Michael Apple, Guy Sinise, Peter Maya, and many more. And now we are very honored, actually very honored to host Joa Paraskiva today. I may not remember how our friendship uh, with you all started, uh, but I can say we are coming from a common a historical culture. Welcome, Joa. Thank you very much. Nice to okay, be here. Eda, the floor is yours, Ida. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is so good to see friends. Thursday talks here after some time. Uh, I'm going to go over some, you know, rules and uh, reminders about the webinar, and I'm going to update you on uh, some of the basics of today's talk. Thank you for showing up from different cities, countries. As um, the introduction by Professor Muzika just stated, our distinguished speaker, Professor Ski will be happy with us today. And before we start, here are some overall reminders. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you can stay muted. So mute your microphones, please. This will help us and all the other participants to enjoy the talk by um, Professor Paraskiva in a better way. And please feel free to use the chat box uh, to type your questions and comments. We really care about them and actually we save them and, you know, collect them and later on we will share it with our speaker. And there will not be a question and answer part at the end of the talk. Uh, so make sure you type your questions in the chat box and then we will um, check the timing. Today we are also trying a new feature, a new Zoom feature. And it is called live transcription. If you go to, you know, caption part and if you click on it there will be an AI generated English transcription of the talk so if you wish to try it you can you can do that and uh, as I mentioned earlier today we are going to have a dialogue with um, Professor Paraskiva and it will take around an hour now uh, let me introduce our host Professor Fatma Muzkaca um, dear participants as you know, Professor Fatma Muzika just specialized in curriculum and instruction, and she is currently a professor at Ankara University in Turkey, and she has been recently hosting Global Thursday Talks on education. And um, now I would like to move on with our speaker, Joa Paraskiva. Uh, Joa Paraskiva is a Mozambican-born pedagogue and critical social theorist a former literacy middle and high school teacher in Southern Africa. is currently a full professor of educational leadership and policy studies at the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, UK. And uh, Paraskiva was founding chair of the Department of Educational Leadership and graduate program director of the doctoral program in educational leadership and policy studies at the University of Massachusetts, uh, Dartmouth. And he was also an honorary fellow at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. So, along with other distinguished universities, Professor Paraskiva is the founder and senior editor of the first open access curriculum journal called Curriculum Sem Frontieras. And he teaches graduate courses on political economy and education, cultural politics and education, critical, anti colonial, and decolonial theories and advanced curriculum theory. 
Paraskiva's work has been translated in nations such as South Korea, China, Finland, uh, Greece, Spain, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, Angola, and Portugal. And the critique acknowledges Paraskiva as one of the most acclaimed curriculum theorists in the world today and responsible for one of the most influential approaches in the field. One of the most exceptional scholars in the field today, open with us for new utopias, a leading authority in the field today, and pioneered a new conceptual grammar, curriculum epistemicide, reversive, uh, reversive epistemicide, momentism, curriculum mechanotics, and item event educational and curriculum theory, uh, which he defines as an epistemological declaration of independence. As Antonia Darder, another previous Global Thursday Talks speaker uh, would claim, uh, per, uh, claims, Paraskiva's work launches a courageous frontal attack on the recurring and unabated epistemical transitions of the left and particularly within academic constructs of critical curriculum theory. Paraskeva's work, Darder adds, will surely persist over time, not because of public relations efforts to promote his work or overwhelming public recognition by those in power, but rather because of the passion, fury, and love uh, that extends beyond the written page and inspires us to dream and labor for a new world. Um, distinguished participants, the floor is Paraskivat right now. I think we can start with the questions. I wish okay. you all. Uh, Joao, would you like to say a word, a hello, and then we can start our, our dialogue? Well, so thank you very much for, first of all, for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm very honored to be in the place that um, so many, what I would call heavyweight intellectuals that I tremendously respect, from Antonia to Michael to Henry, um, which we owe all a great deal um, in this struggle for social, um, cognitive and intergenerational justice. For me, it's a pleasure to be it's a honor. Thank you very much. And I hope I can answer the best way uh, and I can sort of help to have a sort of productive debate or dialogue with colleagues from Turkey and all over the world. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, today we are again hungry for some more intellectual thinking and uh, you know to talk about, to discuss about critical issues, especially on the field of curriculum and instruction that we have been uh, in the field for a long time. And I see here some of my colleagues from the curriculum and instruction area, from, uh, from education, from critical pedagogy, and uh, it will be a hot discussion, I guess. Uh, but sure, before we start discussions, uh, let me ask you, where were you born? And how did you start? How and where have you been grown up? And uh, what made you, you know, uh, to think about and to write about and to work about curriculum and education? Well, um, my my personal trajectory is actually quite connected with what I'm doing. Um, as you said on the presentation, I was born in, in Mozambique, used to be a former Portuguese colony for 500 years um, in the middle, lower, middle, lower um, class interracialized family. My great grandmother was black and my great grandfather was a Greek immigrant came in, coming from Lemnos um, to Egypt, to Alexandria and then moved back to what used to be Nyasalandia and then Mozambique um, at the turn of the 19th century. Uh, and there's a family with a long history of resistance against colonial occupation. Um, 
I was not just influenced by, so my trajectory, it is not just influenced by the education I had and the schools I attend. I did my elementary school during uh, Portuguese colonial times. Mozambique was a Portuguese former colony. And I did my middle and elementary under the Marxist Leninist regime. Um, overnight, um, uh, overnight, we saw changes in the system. Uh, we went to bed, uh, sleep, the country was a colony, specific kind of educational system. And the next day, everything changed um, dramatically. So from an education that was pretty much confined in the schools, I went to an education that was way, way beyond the school walls during the Marxist Leninist regime. So overnight, the radical difference regarding uh, pedagogical approaches, curricular content more relevant with the reality in Mozambique, um, radical difference teaching force, teachers from the Soviet Union came, especially teaching math, uh, physics and chemistry um, from Romania, from Bulgaria, from China, um, from um, the old um, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, um, from Chile, from Argentina, from Brazil, specifically political exiles from Chile, but also from Cuba. And the Cuban professors, the Cuban teachers were the most influential on my trajectory. And I believe I'm being accurate on this claim on my generation. Um, suddenly classes became overtly politicized and political, overtly political. Everything from mathematics to biology, to chemistry, to whatever, there was this um, um, commitment to connect and to transmit um, education as a political praxis to the students. But fundamentally, what I actually um, had a huge influence, at least on me, was the Cuban Armada, the Cuban teachers, and specifically a Cuban mathematic teacher that actually took the advantage of mathematics to explain and to engage in conversations with us about the differences of the contradictions that we were actually witnessing in reality on the daily basis. I remember he was the first one saying in class, what you see in the street is not Marxism, is the worst form of Stalinism. Um, um, so I remember this kind of flag that he used to, um, taking, the space of, taking the space of the classroom um, to actually engage in this kind of conversation with the students that some felt that that was not mathematics, but for some reason it caught my, my attention. Um, in certain, in, it was in this period of, of, um, of a Marxist leninist regime that we start having contacts with the uh, pieces of Marxist tests um, um, from Marx, from Engels, from Mao Zedong. I remember exit from the Cultural Revolution. Um, uh, I mean, countless, but also um, uh, engage deep in a specific kind of literature from Bertolt Brecht, for example. So uh, I remember a piece that he talks about the workers and how it is the responsibility of the workers to emancipate themselves. You cannot wait for others and expect others to do the fight that you have to do it. Uh, so education is pretty much um, um, not politicized, but overtly um, uh, political. Um, also, I remember in going home, and with this, I will go to my conclusion of the first sort of question. Um, I remember at that time, Novosti, which is a Soviet publishing house, open um, in everywhere in Mozambique, and they used to give books for free. And after the, that publishing house was close to my house, and after school, I used to go to my house and used to go buy this Novosti, which is a Soviet publishing house. And I used to grab all the books that they allow me to take, and they allow everybody to take as much as you want. And I remember reading those books and see parallels in the discussions we had in class and all of those cliches, the history of society is the history of, class, of the class struggle, um, religion is the opium of the people. Um, I remember going through some of the theses of Feuerbach. I mean, the point is not to um, interpret society. The point, is, the point is to change and to transform society. A very seminal piece also from Samora Michelle making the school a basis for the people to seize power that we read in, in context of all of those Marxist pieces. And I remember going home and reading all of those books and see parallels in discussions in class, but also in reality, what was happening on the daily basis. Today, I have to confess, I was my 15, 16 years old. 
I feel embarrassed when I look to the interpretations that I used to make when I read those uh, dense pieces at that time. Another aspect quite important in my intellectual journey is that in the Marxist Leninist regime, as I learned at a very early stage in the pieces from Mao Zedong, is that knowledge and thinking is not just based on the book worship. You have to face reality. You have to learn from um, interacting um, with the communities, with different people um, and with different classes. So being a student in the Marxist Leninist regime in my time, you basically had to be a productive human being and you had to pay back to society the fact that you had free public education and free healthcare. So during the long vacations from one year, from one grade to another grade, we were placed in different productive areas in society, most of them agriculture and industrial. And in my three years of high school, for example, on one, on one year I worked in the pineapple plantation for two months for free. Um, I, on, the, on the second year I worked in a beer factory for free, not drinking, but actually working on the packaging. And on another year, because my grades were very poor, I was punished and they put me in the garbage trucks, sort of collecting garbage uh, in trucks. And this was pretty much common. And it helped me tremendously. Um, I was also placed as a literary teacher, literacy teacher, um, uh, teaching. So students from the ninth grade onwards, 10, 11, and 12th grade, they need to go and teach three times a week to peasants how to read and write to fight the literacy percentage, the, the literacy percentage in the country, which was a very successful program. So, um, uh, so this is pretty much my journey as a, as a, as a human being, uh, excuse me. I was also at that time called, we were called the continuators of the revolution. And I was, I was a member of the Frelimo party um, neighborhood cell, they used to call Grupo de Nimizador at that time. So Marxism was everywhere. It saturated society in every single corner to the point that uh, such saturation became kind of a, um, uh, uh, end up being authoritarianist. Uh, and naturally contradictions erupt every day. Um, we start seeing a new form. We start figure out that we went from a specific form of Portuguese colonialism to a new form of base Soviet colonialism is pretty much with a Stalinistic face. Uh, any form of dissent starts being crushed. Um, uh, the, the famous re-education camps, a lot of students were sent to re-education camps, um, uh, physical um, punishment, um, public executions, brutality of the, civic, the, the, the secret police, and the civil war start. It was basically impossible to sustain that. We saw the contradictions. And as I said, as I keep saying to my students, the very tools that were given to me to understand the uh, Portuguese colonial occupation, those same tools, the Cuban professors use them to, to, to help us to understand why and the reasons why what was happening in Mozambique was not nothing to do with Marxist, Leninist, any kind of form, but it was brutal and, and showing the real colors of the brutality of Stalinism applied in Africa, for example. So I left the country, I went to Europe. I did my undergrad um, under the Jesuit institution. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was actually during the Jesuit, um, my interaction with the Jesuits at the Catholic University um, that, um, that I was able through courses like liter literary theory and linguistics that I came across to a huge work of, um, we could call a new left movement um, uh, Chomsky, Williams, Raymond Williams, Terry Eagleton, um, Roland Lombard, Julia Kristeva, all of those that actually I start seeing different forms and I start understanding and develop more and keep upgrading more my um, sort of uh, progressive sort of matrix, if I may say so. I finished my degree as a teacher. I went back to Southern Africa. I taught in South Africa before Mandela being released or so during apartheid and after apartheid. Then I went back to, to Portugal. I did my master's at the University of Minho. At that time, it was a very creative and innovative university with two schools of education, uh, one for elementary, if I may define this way, another one for secondary uh, education. During my master's, sorry, sorry, during my master's, I encountered the works of Michael Apple and Rigi Rue, Peter McLaren, and books like uh, Ideology and Curriculum from, from Michael, 
um, ideology, culture, and the practice of schooling from here, we actually create a huge impact in my um, understanding of the phenomena. Um, I had all of those readings and Marxist readings, and for some reason, those that material allowed me to transfer and to actually, it was a good gateway to understand and to grasp educational phenomena in a better way. But also I was able to interact with um, a group of, um, of leftist professors from Spain, Curcio Torres Santomé, um, Pepe Gimeno, Mariano Enguita, um, that helped me tremendously later on uh, Jose Felix Anglorasco. I mean, let, I mean, a group, a, a, a very vibrant group of leftist, leftist intellectuals in Spain that had connections with the University of Lima. And uh, in my interactions during the, the, the masters, I remember writing an email to Michael and expressing my, because I was reading his work and expressing my uh, reservations regarding the role of the state, because remember it was coming from a brutality of a Marxist in his state and Michael and I engage in a conversation and I end up um, going and study with Michael um, um, in Madison. Uh, during my time in Madison, I, I was able to interact with, um, with all of those great names that were there, Michael Apple, um, um, uh, Tom, Thomas Popkiewicz, for example, another great and sharp um, intellectual, um, very, very sharp as well, um, um, Bernadette Baker, um, this was the place. So Madison at that time was the best school of education in the U.S. I was fortunate um, to be there, but also to, to, uh, to attend the Heaven Center lectures at that time, um, chaired by the late Eric Collins Wright, an analytical Marxist that ended up passing away a couple of years ago. And uh, at the Heaven Center, I was able to attend um, lectures from David Harvey, um, Atili Baron, uh, Margaret Samras, and attend also the lectures and some courses of moving to the social center, which is tremendous influence on my work uh, lately. Uh, so, but one thing that I confirm in Madison um, is that um, I was actually refining my critical um, sort of um, uh, approach, but I was noticing a lack as I noticed already um, in, in my undergrad, uh, there was a kind of a theoretical vacuum or lack of an absence of um, non-Eurocentric voices. And for me, it was puzzling how come it was out of the discussion and out of the equation, um, pieces from Kwame Nkrumah, Milka Cabral, Patrice Lumumba, uh, Samara Michel, Eduardo Mondlan. Mondlan made his PhD in Indiana, for example. Um, why those voices were out of the table? That was a question that I started developing. To be honest with you, it was through Boventura Sosa Santos. And, um, and this reading and this material, another sharp intellectual that actually um, drove me to the position that I am now. Um, so in a nutshell, it was not just education, um, it was a combination of aspects, also personal, um, uh, the family that I was actually coming from um, that allow me to have this sort of um, intellectual journey, if I may say so. Okay, sure. This, this was very impressive, you know, to hear about your life, history, childhood, and the, the context you have been grown up. Because the other day, you know, in the class, we have been discussing about habitus and its connection with curriculum. So we discussed a habitus issue in relation with Baudet. And my students ask me many questions uh, about, uh, you know, how they could, you know, form uh, the meaning of, figure out the meaning of habitus and its relation with curriculum. So this is, we understand that your habitus now made uh, you come here uh, to talk about all these issues, all these problems with us. And I now I'm sending a message, a hidden message to my students here. Uh, yes, I, I'm also uh, impressed this story of, you know, how you started schooling and, you know, everything outside the school and the culture you grew up and thank you. And now, it is time to, to, you know, continue with 
uh, your discussion, your debate, your theories about Eurocentrism, your analysis about Eurocentrism and Western in general, Western hegemony of, of modernism and Eurocentrism, everything. It, it, it's, it's a you know, set of concepts that uh, you are with us today now. How, how, how did you, and where and how did you encounter with Eurocentrism? When did you start thinking about Eurocentrism and hegemonic um, mm -hmm. Western modernity and mm -hmm. what happened? Well, um, Fatima, you, you, you have to understand that, um, I mean, um, first of all, I mean, it. I would say that I didn't, I grew up with that. I didn't encounter, I mean, I was coming from um, a, a family with a huge, huge tradition in, with resistance of resistance against uh, colonial occupation. Um, um, so um, the way the way I thought, of course I was a kid, um, but the way I thought, the way I was thinking and walking was actually profoundly, um, out of the Eurocentric matrix. And that's why um, to use a, a concept by Priyam Vada Gopal, which is this uh, brilliant um, scholar, I was not an accident, I was never an accidental anti-Eurocentric. I grew up with that. The moment you actually um, exist out of the Eurocentric platform, you always add odds with the system that is actually framed in Eurocentric terms for this position and wage. Um, what I never had at that time, because I mean, it was an earlier age and I still have, I think I don't have now, no one has, is the language that actually could help me um, survive the system and challenge the system in a better way. Uh, I, still, I, think, I, I still think we don't have the language um, to fight this beast. That is the fascination of theory for me. That is my interest in theory. And again, I'm quoting my, a Cuban professor uh, in Mozambique 30 years ago, still remember his name, Otto Renald Manes Garrido, that uh, um, that's the fascination of theory. Imagine a math, a math professor taking the space of class to theorize about the practices you are having. Um, um, and for me, theory is a constant struggle between the language you have and reality because you have to describe and to understand that reality, okay? So as Boaventura Sousa Santos argue, to theorize or to write about or to, to think about something, it's to, put, it's, to, it's to permanently put the categories you have about your thought and your, and, your, and your language at the edge of a specific abyss that you actually identify, okay? And I guess, reminding Slavo Žižek, which is very instrumental in my work as well, um, um, I can quote him saying that um, we claim the things that we know that we claim because we just don't know it. We don't have the language to understand what we don't know. So that's why that is the fascination of theory. And the book of Ajaz Ahmad, for example, on theory is brilliant and explains the tough, how tough it is to crunch ideas. Crunching numbers, it's much more easy. Crunching ideas, it affects your own being your own identity, the way you understand things, yourself, so far and so forth. So um, also, uh, uh, as I mentioned in, in the question before, in my intervention before, um, uh, I'm coming from this family with a huge, huge resistance against colonial occupation. My uncle is still a, a figure, um, still alive and a figure that fought Portuguese colonialism. He was arrested, he was tortured, um, when he was released, he fled. He's one of the foundational members of Frelimo. Um, he was the Minister of Agriculture that produced the major, during the marxist leninist uh, regime, that produced a major agrarian revolution in the country. Um, that uh, I used to, history used to, I mean, history was at the table of our house, at the dinner of our house. I remember um, some of his sayings, uh, of my uncle's a public saying that became that made him a, a, a sort of a, a sort of famous in quotes 
when he claimed that when you find yourself in a conversation with a peasant, you don't see an illiterate. You don't see any form of illiteracy. You see different forms of knowledge. Okay, but my uncle was also the director of the uh, Mozambican Institute, which is Ferelimo School during the armed struggle in, in Tanzania, during colonial times. And, uh, and together with others like uh, Gideon Dobb and uh, Jacinto Veloso and Teresa Veloso, he was responsible to build the textbook to actually help the country and Ferelimo to fight illiteracy, the literacy rates. And guess what? It was, um, at odds with Paulo Freire's sort of uh, uh, literacy strategy. There were meetings. This, this deserves to be explored, to be honest with you. There were meetings between Paulo Freire and Frelimo that Frelimo didn't agree with Paulo Freire approach. Um, and they walk away, they, they partake. So um, when I was a literacy teacher in Mozambique, we didn't follow the Paulo Freire um, a strategy or concept, you know what I'm saying? So this was all part of, um, of, um, of, uh, of my intellectual um, journey. So I was not, I didn't encounter Eurocentrism. Was basically, I was always at odds. I didn't have the language. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and being, an, for example, during Portuguese colonial times, um, we used to study all the rivers of Portugal in Mozambique. All the, the, all the train stations, all the mountains. So you, we knew everything from Portugal, from the monumentalization to use the concept of moving to the social centers of the empire. And we didn't know anything about Mozambique, about the land that we used to live. So there was also this contradiction, this clash, this conflict. Well, also after colonial times, uh, after neo-colonial times, when the, when the Mozambique became Marxist Leninist, we also start seeing that we move from one form of domination to another form of domination. So this, um, later on, I understood from the works of Boventura Sousa Santos, Emmanuel Wallenstein, Anibal Quijano, Enrique Dussel, Walter Mignolo, um, the concept, uh, the, the, the strong, the, the powerful concept of coloniality, which is different from colonialism. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, the problem is the language that I was having and I was actually learning in this um, sort of post-colonial time in Mozambique, they tell me to deconstruct the colonial power, Portuguese colonial power, also allow me to understand that uh, during colonial, during, um, uh, uh, after independence, during the marxist leninist regime, we were facing a different form of, of, of foreign domination and colonial domination at that time, pretty much in the hands of the Soviets, that in my understanding, there's been research done about that, create a lot of, a lot of conflict within the very own core of the Frelimo uh, 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 party. So, and when I arrived in Europe, for example, um, it was a shock for me because we used to learn, um, you have to understand that the kid in Africa, it doesn't understand something so simple for Europeans like cold. Cold for us is something on the movies. We don't, we don't necessarily experience the reality of clothes, snow and stuff like that. So the way I was educated, how the Portuguese colonial empire was monumental, strong, with colonies over the world, pioneers in this sort of colonization empire. Okay, when I arrived in Portugal the first time, and we used to learn all the rivers from Portugal, and in my understanding was, well, those rivers must be huge compared with ours. And I remember when I arrived in Portugal, it was a shock because not only the country was, it's like everything is small, the rivers were like tiny, tiny, we don't consider that rivers in Africa, but also, I was first, I was seeing firsthand that this country that was actually the colonial empire did not know anything or almost nothing about me, a person like me, or about my country, zero. Um, uh, um, I was defined as, as I was actually treated condescending in a condescending way. I was defined as pure, um, uh, like innocent with no sins, uh, but also with no rules and discipline with no name, we used to call people like us retornados, um, with no place in the history of that country. So all of that actually um, um, made me even more aware that I was actually um, uh, out of that sort of Eurocentric, of course, I didn't have the language at that time, okay? I end up uh, refining my examination based on this sort of 
aspects, inter interpretation of Rialta was making. And more and more, um, the work of um, African intellectuals, especially African intellectuals, um, Samora Machel, Kwam de Kruma, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an African intellectual that um, Boaventura Sosa Santos rightly mentioned as the first um, 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 uh, epistemology of the South, which is uh, Aquino de Bargança. He has a piece written with Emmanuel, Emmanuel Wallenstein, a lot of stuff written in Portuguese, but quite a few pieces translated in English. Um, um, Kwam Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, um, Thomas Sankara, there's a huge amount of, uh, and, and poetry, I mean, from Creverinha and others, uh, Noemi de Souza, a lot of Mario de Andrade, Milka Cabral, there's a huge array of literature that people, the, of intellectuals wrongly defined as freedom fighters. Um, and in my understanding, as I mentioned, for me, it was always awkward to understand that this thing that we call critical thinking only exists in Europe. So it, it means that for an African being to be critical, he needs to um, unnaked himself for his, for his cognitive capacities and, and swallow an Eurocentric sort of cognitive framework to think critically. Well, critical thinking exists everywhere. Critical ways of existing, reading the world exist in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East. I recommend countless works from Africa, from the Middle East and from Latin America that people think critically, not necessarily within the same matrix and cognitive yarn design. Um, by, and this is not a critique on the critical theory and on, of Eurocentric nature, is to say there is other ways of thinking critically, not necessarily based on an Eurocentric epistemological matrix. Because to admit that and to claim that, it's a form of epistemicide. And, and, and so, excuse me, uh, people being, um, uh, that, uh, so uh, this is how everything that I was reading, even today, I read with non-Eurocentric lenses and specific maybe in most of the case with African diopteries, because that's the way I am. So I'm trying to, I don't, I, I think that in a world, as I mentioned repeatedly in my work, in a world that is epistemologically diverse, it is impossible to claim from one epistemological position that that position as the solution or the alternatives to address issues like poverty, starvation, segregation, inequality, um, so far and so forth. That's why I start looking for an approach that actually could, um, because I don't have a Manichaeist position, that actually include all of the diversity, all of this epistemology, the, uh, uh, an approach that is non-derivative as Sosa Santos and other decolonial scholars claim, but also an approach that actually could be responsive to the world's epistemological difference and diversity. And, and that's why um, uh, 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 one of the aspects that was missing, that's why the work of Hubner and Deleuze is important to me, but also of, um, of African writers like Mia Koto, I encourage the reading of the work Mia Koto, it's profoundly translated in English, I don't know in, in, if it's translated in Turkey, uh, but one of the things that immediately popped up to me is that we have, the, we have a lack of a specific language to deal with this. Our representations of the real as Deleuze claims are totally, totally, totally twisted. We have a myopic vision of the problem because we assume that there's only one form of dominance and one alternative. And even if the, even though that claim that socialism is the alternative, as Sosa Santos claimed, there are many ways to produce this socialist alternative or social democratic uh, alternative. So in doing that, um, uh, uh, the first draft of this show up in 2006, I start penciling the first draft of this itinerant, of this uh, non-derivative approach uh, that was intentionally silent. I have to launch a footnote here that probably not uh, surprisingly, uh, there is an institution in Portugal that prohibit my books to be sold. So for some reason, so which is not a surprise to me. In 2006, I was invited by the colleagues in Brazil uh, which I had passed that first draft that was published in Portugal in 2006. And the uh, AMPED, which is the equivalent, the biggest um, annual meeting in Brazil for educators, AMPED, uh, invite me in 2006 to review for 2007 all uh, uh, um, 20 plus, almost 30 major um, um, curriculum projects in public institutions in Brazil. It was a fantastic uh, uh, challenge I had. 
And uh, in, the, in doing that review and in the presentation of that uh, review that I had and the discussion that went, uh, uh, the, 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 the room was packed about two hours and a half um, of that presentation and debate. Uh, uh, first of all, in reading those uh, uh, research projects, I saw that my colleagues in Brazil were having the same problem, was having the same pains, but from a different angle. They were using, they were raising the same problems, but using different tools and different approaches. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not the only one seeing this. So there are other people seeing the same phenomena, but, but that approach made my approach more rich. That's why I claim everywhere that curriculum studies in Brazil in certain areas by far much more deep, developed, creative, innovative, and um, you can put all of the words that come after this than any other part of the world, including, including the US. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so, uh, and I claim that what actually was born a year before um, actually start crawling and left the diapers, um, get rid of the diapers in Brazil in 2007. And that's where uh, um, I start claiming, um, and that's where, that's where uh, itinerant curriculum theory has been defined by others as a new conceptual grammar, as a challenge of the epistemicide, but also of what I call the reverse of epistemicide, which is, I think, and this is one of my claims, that, uh, that uh, um, one of the reasons why we have problems as, 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 as a counter-dominant sort of group is that, uh, of course, neoliberalism is very triumphant, is very powerful, is being mercilessly uh, and, 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 and has been brutalizing um, um, populations and communities all over the world. But, but we, in my understanding, there's something wrong as well. This is just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that I think there is fundamental problems in the in our critical approach that we ourselves need to address. And instead of ignoring that these problems exist and thinking that they will go away and, uh, and uh, that eventually uh, uh, by pressing certain button neoliberalism would fade and we will be um, in, the, in, the, in the different dominant uh, um, position. I think that again, this is where I like Zizek um, and Zizek makes the following claim that I, say, that I think it, it captures my sentiment and, my, and, and the spirit of ICT. Zizek says that he is a good Hegelian, well, I think I am too, in which he claimed, if you have a good theory, forget about reality. So that is the point. But the problem is for me, a good theory is not a perfect theory. A good theory is a just theory. It's a theory that everybody in the world somehow understands that feels that what he sees in that particular theory is responsive, it responds to their concerns, responds to their traditions, respects the principles, the customs, the cultural, but also a bunch of, of, of aspects that cannot just be um, uh, uh, sort of uh, crushed by uh, dominant uh, epistemologies that control what we think about science. And on this, the work of Henry, um, especially the initial phase of Henry's work is profoundly important to understand uh, um, the cult of positivism the scientificity of science, that for something to be truth, it needs to follow those categories. Well, I have a problem with this. And we all need to have a problem with that. So I think that all of this to actually make it clear that I didn't encounter um, this critique on Eurocentrism. I, work, I was actually um, born with this. I mean, like me, many, many other people um, that actually don't actually operate out that actually operates sort of out of the Eurocentric matrix, not just on the scientific issues, but believe me, I don't know if some of you have contacts or reality now, in Africa, the concept of time is so different. The concept of, the concept of space is so different. In Africa, I grew up when we, from trivial things, when we meet somebody, we say three o'clock, but it's around three, could be 310, 330, 320, quarter to three, it's around three. It's, it's somehow around three o'clock. It's somehow around four o'clock. So the concept of time, the concept of space, the concept of individual and of individualism, okay? It's profoundly different. There's no, it is more a community existence. 
It is more, uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, are following this, there, there are uh, sort of movements in specific parts of Northern Africa against what in the West has been called of plagiarism because people don't accept there is the originality of idea. As Sosa Santos claim, all knowledge is co-knowledge, is intra-knowledge. Okay, so, and I'll stop here, otherwise, you need to stop me, otherwise I don't stop. I cannot listen to you. Jam, ho jam, Fatma okay. jam. Uh, we couldn't hear you, your microphone. That's not on. The microphone is still mute. You are still muted. Cannot hear. I think there's a tiny little technical problem. Uh, No, Jan. Can you can you try the that? Ask to un I uh, ask you to unmute, but it doesn't work. You want me to unmute? Okay. Um, maybe you I can go on with the next question. Okay solving the issue. So okay. you mentioned the differences in time and the perspective on education. And uh, this makes us remember your theory, right? Um, you moved on with the itinerant uh, curriculum theory. So what do you mean by itinerant curriculum theory with all the um, concepts that we have mentioned, like journeying, nomadic, or unsettled? How would you like to elaborate on this? Well, again, um, uh, it's it, it it's 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 an approach that attempts to respond and to respect um, and to reflect the world endless epistemologically diversity and difference. It is not in in saying that it is people's theory. It is not a perfect theory because you don't have a perfect theory. Um, it is the theory that actually everybody in the world feels represented, feels um, respected. Um, I see theory uh, or itinerant curriculum, education curriculum theory, among other issues, respects or understands that, uh, and again, this is sort of a battle between um, the Marxist Feuerbach thesis the point is not to interpret, the point is to transform society. Okay, but for you to transform accurately, you need to interpret accurately. So uh, itinerant curriculum theory is the theory that, um, as both as both Ventura Sosa Santos argues, um, understands that modern Western thinking um, is an abyss of thinking, which is the very matrix of what the colonial scholars coin as coloniality. What is abyssal thinking means? As Sosa Santos claimed, it's a system of visible and invisible distinctions. Okay, and uh, and uh, this invisible distinction is established by a radical line. Okay, that divides social reality in two realms: the realm of this side of the line, and the realm of the other side of the line. And what exists on this side of the line, it's true, it's real, it's legit, and on the other side of the line, it doesn't exist. It's 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 it's, it's it, so it is defined, and um, there is non-existence. It's it, the visibility of this side of the line creates the invisibility of the other side of the line. It's it's a non-dialectical absence. It doesn't exist. It's pointless because there's nothing there. Okay, so Athenian curriculum theory and theorists understands that this is this is a fact. This is a fact. This is modern Western thinking. It's abyssal. 
it's a derivative, okay? Also, it understands concomitantly that there's a problem with this. Why? Because in a world that is endless epistemologically so diverse, it is impossible to claim that from one epistemological position, one would have the solution for a world to call Samir Amin, for a world that we all wish to see. Well, it's impossible. Theoretically, impossible. Philosophically, impossible. But also at the level of the praxis, it's completely impossible. And that's why the clashes we have, even within the left. Okay? Another thing that uh, 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 itinerant curriculum theory uh, understands or tries to understand is how dominant is critical theory within the counter dominant platform, i.e., within this counter dominant movement, is critical theory and pedagogic is still dominant or not? And if it isn't, why it isn't? Why it is not dominant? And to this drives me to another issue, which is. Um, um, if this modern Western thinking is actually an abyss of thinking, as both into the social Santos rightly claims, this doesn't happen out of the blue. It happens because, and this is how to say helps us with the uh, uh, social apparatuses, this exists because we have institutions designed to maintain this abyss. One of those institutions is educational institutions. And the educational institutions through the curriculum, to the teacher training, to the evaluation, to the very structure of the schools, through its form and its content, it's an apparatus that actually, all to say, was brilliant when he said that uh, represses its ideological and repressive machine, okay? And that creates this abyssality. In the moment that you assume and you consciously assume that you are actually part of a system that actually it's abyssal and produces the other side of the line as non-existence, immediately you have to second move into the Sosa Santos and admit that we are actually facing an epistemicide. This epistemicide is not created by fiat, it's not in the bookshelf. This epistemicide has been produced through the schools, to the judicial system, to the prisons, to the healthcare. It's epistemicidal. Well, one of the institutions that is designed to actually produce, maintain, evaluate, and perpetuate this epistemicide, it's our schools, but not abstractively, not abstractively, it's our schools to the curriculum that propagates in schools. Okay? So the dominant group that actually control the curriculum or the dominant forces are pretty much actually the perpetrators of the epistemicide. But in my understanding, and this is my argument, the problem is, and I mentioned this in my latest book, is that counter dominant groups in fighting the epistemicide, they, will, they have been unable to interrupt such epistemicide. And in many cases, they reproduce the epistemicide. That's why um, we face this kind of hiatus that we are now. Okay, so the itinerant curricular theory is quite aware that both dominant and counter dominant groups are epistemicidal. That's why I call a reverse of epistemicide, which is in fighting the epistemicide. In some ways, you mitigate, in many other ways, you actually uh, 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 reinforce the epistemicide. Okay, also, um, the itinerant curricular theory understands that there's a fundamental problem with critical theory. We, need, we critical theorists need to understand that we need to think where, in which part of our theoretic approach we are actually failing, or we are not actually being so accurate. For example, uh, as Boventura Sosa Santos claims in a, in a brilliant 1999 piece, okay, in a world that is so much to criticize, why critical theory doesn't become dominant? What is wrong with critical theory? Have we ever thought critical theorists among ourselves, that may be our platform, our arguments, our tools are exhausted. And we have to go and look to, 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 to reach out to non-Eurocentric approaches from the Middle East, from, from, from Latin America, from Southern Africa, from, Middle, from Central Africa, from Northern Africa, and trying to understand how can we actually create not just a, a compositive approach with add-ons, but kind of a radical, as Sosa Santos claim and other decolonial scholars, a kind of a composite approach a kind of a radical co-presence, non-derivative approach, okay, to, to, to address the problems we have in society, okay. Incapacity, as attendant curriculum theory claims, incapacity to understand it, to go beyond the Eurocentric platform and to understand that there are different forms of oppression, different forms of domination, 
okay? Um, for example, uh, um, uh, 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 what Ed, what um, uh, Lord claims, the master's tool cannot actually deconstruct the master's house, or what Sosa Santos claim that the reason that that the reason that um, the colonizers cannot be the same reason alone that produces emancipation, alone it cannot because it was designed to colonize. Okay, so uh, this is how uh, aspects of uh, of, uh, but also. I believe, um, again, um, the work of Saramago is important here. I think that the way, not critical theory, and I've been misinterpreted, not critical theory. I'm claiming that the way we do critical theory needs to stop. We cannot keep working the, the way we used to work in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s. We cannot, we are on the shoulders of, my task, my task is to actually um, uh, respect um, um, uh, 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 um, the, the only reason we have this discussion is because others before us, Michael, Henry, Peter, Roger Simon, Antonia Dada, already opened many lines for us. So we have to respect what they do. We have to respect, uh, and Antonia is being ferociously important and ferociously sharp in actually went above and beyond this, for example, many others, but I mentioned Antonio Dallo because he's been also very influential in my uh, uh, examination, okay? So the point is not as both as Sosa Santos and I mentioned on my work, the point is not to denigrate or to shoot the utopists or the utopists or to, or to trash what was done, but to understand they did what they had to do. It is our task now in the res respectful way to move this to this level or to a different level. Not, not because they cannot. I'm not saying some of them are doing it. Uh, Michael still, still keeps writing. Henry keeps writing. You told me that Michael and Henry were here before. So, but it is our task to not repeat what they already actually said. It is said, it's been defined. Let's grab and take advantage uh, of that, of the work that they do, they did, and they keep doing and build a more robust approach because the problems I'm sharing with you you're going to see in Michael's work, in Henry's work, in Peter's work, not so Peter, but Antonio's work, um, and many other scholars, Thomas Popkiewicz, this, this conflict, this frustration, it's right there, okay? So the way we do, as José Saramago, the Nobel Prize literature said, there is no future without death. And I'm claiming that the way we do critical theory needs to die and we have to think and to do together with anti-decolonial and anti-colonial and decolonial approach, we have to think and to do alternative ways to think critical theory alternatively. And in the plurality of aspects that needs to, in doing that, I'm claiming that we need to deterioralize critical theory. We have to get out of this map of this uh, sort of uh, Eurocentric matrix. A deterioralized curriculum theory, it's gradually uh, increasingly an iterant curriculum theory, a theory of non-spaces, okay, that is sentient of the world epistemological difference and diversity, that is perpetually stable. Why is stable? Because you become a strange in your own language. The moment you have to reach out to other spaces, you became unstable, but the instability, it's part of a theoretical process, not stability. I claim a perpetual inst instability. I claim that the theorist is a constant migrant, is an epistemological pariah, is aware that it cannot be a, a, a superposition of one epistemological point to another epistemological point, okay? It's a volcanic chain. This is what I define as the theoretical approach. Epistemize the epistemology of the South, from the South, which is as moving to the claims, learning from the South, going to the South. This is fundamentally important. I'm going to provide you a couple of stories if I have the time. In doing that, it is, that's why I was mentioned, um, it is an epistemological declaration of independence. Why? Because it, it doesn't actually subscribe this, the, 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 the undermining certain epistemological positions regarding other epistemological positions, okay? It's responsible to the world's epistemological tradition. It is, as Marx claimed in the 1879 piece, a ruthless critique of everything existing which is a ruthless critique of every existing epistemology, including the ones you work on. You have to be ready to expose to that. It's a decolonial term. It's a radical co-presence. Yes, it's discomfort, but it is 
uh, it's non-derivative. It's to think, to be non-derivative is to think from the perspective of the other side. It's to, it's to respect that the other side exists and he has legitimate, he has epistemological legitimacy. Think things differently. It's non maicaistic It is not, it does not romanticize indigenous knowledge and non eurocentric knowledges. In Africa, non eurocentric people do sins. They sin. They commit crime. We normal, we perfect, we normal people. Don't infantilize non eurocentric beings. We also now, we also know how to be evil, how to think, how to be creative in our own way. Okay. So, and it is, I think that on this, Yubna for me, it's important because, um, how can I say, uh, um, I'm not romanticizing this. The first time, I'm not romanticizing my position. The first time ICT was presented in the United States, um, it created a lot of um, sort of uh, uh, waves, okay? And I see and I notice tendencies to silence. I notice. Um, and, 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 and this turn, why? Because this turn, again, is one of the critiques that, um, that I do uh, on, on the field. Uh, why? Because this was not, I'm sorry, but this, this, didn't, this didn't come, um, how can I say, um, this was not created uh, in the uh, um, Eurocentric, um, liberal, white control laboratory in the global north. Okay? Um, it is what it is. Um, and uh, ICT attempt to contribute to the complicated conversation. And as Dwayne Eubner mentioned, is the forward of my latest book, unfortunately, that complicated conversation is becoming itself an epistemicide. Um, I end up with this, um, Fatima and colleagues, with this story that I share with all of my students that shows how wrong we are and how wrong is our educational system. Um, I'm being a privilege uh, because I born and I'm an African um, descendant. And I've been teach and taught in different parts of the world um, from Africa to Latin America, to Europe, to Central Europe, Northern Europe. Um, United States. In every single class, in every single, now where I am now, in every single institution, I always do this with my students. I read a say from a major, major social theorist without telling a name. And what I say to the students is the following. There is this major, major social scientist that says the following. In economic, <coughs> excuse me, in the analysis of any economic form, and education is certainly one of them, I'm quoting. In the analysis of any uh, economic form, and education is certainly one of them, nor my, uh, neither uh, microscopes nor chemical regions are of any assistance. We need to replace both with the power of abstraction. So I say this to the students in different parts of the world and I say, can you react to this overwhelming Everybody agrees with this say, well, it's a fact. I mean, of course, I mean, education, we have to be abstract, we have to think, everybody agrees. The moment I mention who said it, the majority start having doubts if the quote is actually accurate. The moment I mention who actually said this, who actually wrote this more than 100 years ago, the majority all over the world, from Brazil to Africa, Angola, um, South Africa, Mozambique, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Canada, whatever, uh, Finland, uh, the majority in class, well, 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 yeah, now that I'm reading better, I uh, have the double thought, maybe it's not accurate. Well, the guy that says this, it's a guy that actually agree or disagree under his conceptualization of society, huge radical transformations happen in the 21st century directly or indirectly connect with him. The guy who said this was Karl Marx in the first edition of Capital. The moment I mentioned to the students, the guy who said this was Karl Marx, immediately the majority said, well, may, maybe there's something wrong here with this quote. If I had said, because I said, who said this? Well, some people say, well, Bill Clinton, Obama, whatever, they claim all the names, Tony, whatever, uh, they say all the names, okay? But the moment I said, the guy who said this is Karl Marx, 80%, 80%, I'm being, I'm being modest, say, well, maybe this is wrong. Well, ICT, um, it's a sublime example of Marx's claim. 
it epitomizes, in my understanding, the power of abstraction. This is my take on, it's not a recipe. That's why I cannot produce a recipe, but it's, it's a respectful theoretical approach. It's a people theory, the moment, that's why I said, there's a British Oxford philosopher, J.L. Austin, that talks about um, um, performative utterance, okay? Um, does something by say it, attempts to do something by say it. That's why it is, that's why I claim that um, could be well defined as a declaration of epistemological independence. Okay, sure. Can I, can I interrupt, please? please. Uh, sorry for the technical problem a while ago. I, I had to reconnect uh, to the room, sorry. Uh, what, what you have been talking about uh, reminds me the nation state building process in the Central Asia and in the Middle East and their efforts, you know, I, I got involved very shortly in, in the process of curriculum making in the countries, you know, post-Soviet countries in Central Asia. And their efforts, you know, uh, to make a national curriculum definitely connects us to ICT. Mm -hmm. But they are supported by the European, you know, European projects in their curriculum making or, you know, rebuilding their education system or, you know, rebuilding social sciences. Mm -hmm. And European countries show great interest mm -hmm. in their efforts to, to rebuild education in social sciences. Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. Sweden, Switzerland, mm -hmm. they, you know, they invest with a lot of money and projects and, you know, human resources mm -hmm. and they, mm -hmm. you know, they go there and it is, uh, and then it turns into kind of modernity uh, in their, you know, nation state mm -hmm. uh, efforts, building nation mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. So what you have been saying, you know, so far is, is very relevant to, to see the case in Middle East now and in Central Asia, not only in Turkey, of course, mm -hmm. the, the region we are in now is worthwhile to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for, from now on, I will leave the floor to Eda. We have other questions because we usually connect the subject here to COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, we take it as a crisis, as a global crisis. And uh, we need to learn about, you know, to hear more about how would you connect the issues you you are talking about with this crisis time, with this pandemic time, and maybe post-pandemic time. Eda, Eda has uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. While I was listening to ICT and your comments, uh, I remember you know, what you wrote in your latest article. You say, we live in an era that normalized absurdism and abnormality. And um, we want to ask, what do you mean when you say COVID-19 is a wake up call to learn, to unlearn what we have learned? Mm -hmm. Do you think we could move towards a country Germanic, a Eurocentric era? And mm -hmm. can this be a lesson that we can learn, you know, from this pandemic? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, I hope not at all. I hope not. I hope we don't move to uh, a counter hegemonic Eurocentric era. I mean, I think the battle is not to replace one canon from another canon. Um, um, uh, I already had that syrup. Um, uh, and uh, believe me, um, uh, although I value a lot my Marxist Leninist experience in Mozambique, and to be honest with you, um, in many ways, it was profoundly productive, and I think it's productive. Um, but my, I think the struggle is not to replace one form of canon or one form of dominance by another form of dominance. So I hope not, I understand the question. And I would say the following, COVID-19 for me 
should be seen as another double scandal or um, another form of scandal, um, sort of a global scandal, which is um, sort of a, with two sides of the coin. One um, that, that actually defines what Giovanni Arrighi uh, claims as the third phase or the third area of era of um, hegemonic um, uh, phase of uh, sort of the third hegemonic phase of capitalism, if I may say so, uh, in the long 20th century's 2005 book, Giovanni Arrighi. Um, uh, why is this two sides of the coin in here? Because on one hand, documents the consequences of this global scale, but on the other hand, also shows how erroneously dominant groups are actually deal with such malaise. Okay, immediately uh, erupt and immediately was defined as a disease of the other, a disease created by the other. Remember the contradiction, the other, the other. The, so the other side of the line that doesn't exist, that, um, that is rational. This disease was framed by folks like Mr. Trump, Bolsonaro and many others as a Chinese virus, the disease of the other, okay? So, excuse me. In one of my latest pieces, I actually claim, as you rightly mentioned, as this is another sample or example or graphic example of the area of the absurd, of the cruelty of the absurd. And I go to Camus, I go to Antoine Artaud, I go to Esselin to define and to explain this absurd in which, um, or, and Arendt, in which it, it's like um, we've, we're leaving the banality, the triviality of the absurd. I mean, it's normal. I mean, people, the images of the third world, the images of Italy, the images of China, everywhere in the world, we it was kind of unthinkable that we'll be actually having this kind of, uh, of experience, okay? Um, but for me, COVID-19, it's just another example of, of this absurdity that we are living. And data does not lie. Data actually shows this, okay? For example, between 1900 and 1999, the US consumed 4.5 million tons of cement. Between, 900, between 900 and 1995, the US consumed alone 4.5 um, million tons of cement. But between 2011 and 2013, in two years, China alone consumed 6.5 million tons of cement. So in two years, China overcome, so uh, blew up uh, almost um, 10 years of of, of, of consumerism of cement in the US. Um, um, by 2017, 18 and 19, by August, the planet has exhausted its natural resources. It means that after August until December, we are, on, we are actually on, in debit, okay? Regarding natural resources. Extractivism, as Catherine Walsh, which I recommend reading, um, that writes beautifully and there's a latest book with Walter Mignolo, extractivism is actually driving the planet to an unsustainable limit, okay? As Paul Virilio claims, this Italian philosopher, we're living um, in a sort of a kind of ecological bomb. We experience a kind of ecological bomb. In China as well, this again, evidence after evidence. So uh, in China, um, Xi Jinping pumped a new kind of a social political economy. Okay, with Chinese characteristics, which is basically a replication of the coloniality model. Okay, in Brazil, in the US, two presidents at least were elected democratically, insulting minorities, people uh, with disabilities, women, and people of color. And, and, and they were elected in saying that. Okay, President Donald Trump, former president of the United States, which is not the president anymore. But before the election said, and he was elected, that he could kill someone in New York in the streets and nothing would happen to him. Okay? In India, another problem we have, in India, Modi right turn unleashed a belligerent sort of rationalism of the Indian nation. Okay? You just have to use a strategy, okay, of listen to the voices without necessarily agreeing with them and co-op them. Okay? In Israel, it's the only country in the world that it's tough to study geography of Israel because they keep changing the borders. I mean, you never know what the borders 
Ah, okay. The colony, the colonists, not, you know what I'm saying? So in Hungary, in Poland, the right is becoming ferocious. In the UK, they decide to Brexit. They have the luxury to decide, I'm leaving now. Now I'm leaving, I'm leaving Europe. I'm going on my own. They have the luxury to say that, okay? What seems to be neutral is not neutral. It's not neutral, okay? In Catalonia, people voted for independence from Spain. In Andalusia, the far right Vox got 12 seats in parliament. What we see, huge masses of immigrants trying to come from Northern Africa and Southern Africa to Europe in both, they prefer dying that the deplorable conditions of existence, okay? So, but also as Byung Chung Ha Han, the South Korean philosopher based in Germany claims, what we see is a hunting, it's open hunting season of the other. Globalization, as Han claims, it's the coercive violence of the identical. You either like me, or I'm gonna gun you down. You either become like me, or I'm gonna gun you down. And I'm gonna use the schools to make you like me. I'm gonna use the judicial system to make you like me, to transform you like me, not just the, on, on the body, the cognitive, the way you think, the way you interpret the world, the way you do things, okay? So as, um, and the list is endless. So fascism, as Orkheimer said, decades ago is becoming respectable, becoming normalized. Authoritarianism is becoming, it's almost smelling like a need. As Carl Schmitt, the German Nazi um, uh, scientist said, necessity makes the law. You create a necessity and then the law shows up to cover that necessity. And as Naomi Wolf claims in a novel uh, it, with excerpts from Stalin and Hitler, democracy has been killed democratically. Hitler said, I'm gonna use any quotes. She quotes Naomi Wolf, the end of America. She claims she went to the minutes of the meetings of the Nazis in which Italy is saying, I'm gonna use democracy. I'm gonna use the mechanisms of democracy to crush democracy. That's what we're seeing right now. And to claim that it's not functional, okay? So the outbreak of the, outbreak, the, outbreak of the current pandemic, okay, cannot be detached from this, um, uh, from this phenomenon because after all of these events, okay, to add more ashes on the fire, we have the abrupt eruption of this pandemic, okay? So the pandemic, this outbreak, cannot be detached, as I claim, from this um, arrogance of Eurocentric exceptionalism that start defining the pandemic. Oh, that's nothing. That's, it's not going to reach the shores. And we start seeing the wave coming, start defining as, as created by the earth. It was, from the, it was more important to actually state that it was a disease created by the others or the other instead of trying to figure out why we end up in this mess. Another one, okay, to actually shut down the world. A, vi a virus from the other signifying something that exists that came from the other side, the other side of the line, okay? Um, excuse me. Uh, what what actually it, it, it actually covers is that, uh, and that's why uh, it shows this arrogant exceptionalism of, 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 of the dominant in the Western world, is that it didn't learn much from the previous SARS decades ago. But I would call Varoufakis that actually, Yanis Varoufakis that actually explains this, which is the pandemic came and only exacerbates a crisis that was already in place. It's dormant, but it was there. Okay, so when COVID-19 arrived in the scene, Varoufakis came more or less like this, okay, it found global capitalism like sitting in a gigantic bubble while but dormant, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that was private debt, for example. Um, and and, and <clears throat> so, so COVID is a crisis of a crisis, okay? It's, it's, um, it's a violent crisis of the violent finance. It exposes that as well as Marazzi claims. Okay, so this is one form of analysis that I agree. There's also the debate between the social scientists, uh, Giorgio Agamben saying that uh, the uh, COVID-19, it is una invenzione, it was misreading, uh, Zizek interacts with him, and then move into the social science as well. But I would prefer to go back to a, a scholar that's fundamentally important to, I think, to us, which is Bruno Latour, okay? Bruno Latour in his book, Pandora's Book, uh, in his chapter, 
uh, about there's a chapter be taught, be, uh, there's a, there's a, he has a chapter about the microbes and Pasteur, and 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 that drives influence the title of my piece. And he asked, and this is the question I think we need to ask. Where was COVID-19 before the scientists? Where was that? Actually, who's, who saw who first? This is the question I need to ask, or we should ask as curriculum scholars to understand what is our role as pedagogues in this, okay? And Latour says, and I agree, and I think we all agree with this, phenomena is not lying down in a sofa with a remote watching TV. Phenomena are socially constructions uh, aspects, okay? Phenomena are not out there waiting for the researcher to assess them, okay? So, and Latour claims that the lactic acid ferments have to be made visible by Pasteur's work, okay? Like COVID-19, this disease, this virus need to be made visible by the scientist's work. So who's who on this? Maybe this should be the question to figure out and to actually clean a lot of misunderstandings that, that, uh, that we have, which is the article metaphor, and I'm gonna uh, uh, take a note here and read as a, a, a brief paragraph. The article metaphor, Latour adds, may account for the visible, but not for making something visible. In Latour, as he claimed, in other words, the industrial metaphor may explain why something is made, but not why, and how it was actually made and become visible. This is fundamentally important to help understand that microbes happen for, uh, uh, sort of happened for Pasteur, like Pasteur happened for microbes, the same thing with COVID-19, it happened for the scientists, like the scientists happened for the virus. So, and why are we trying to understand this as something split, as something not in a dialogical uh, 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 relationship? So, COVID-19, in my understanding, clarify the cruel colors of this absurd that we are living that shows the world as an incomprehensible place, incomprehensible place, to a point that dominant powers in dominant countries don't understand, that the point is also to help poor countries, otherwise we will not contain the damage, we will not contain the virus. It keeps mutating, it keeps mutating. So no one is safe. For the first time, humanity is confronted with something that no one is safe. And of course, we, sh we should not domesticate because definitely is impacting more poor communities and poor countries than rich countries, okay? So in my understanding, colleagues and folks, educational theorists like we are social uh, 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 sort of uh, theorists, pedagogues, we should not be absent of this debate. We should be participants in this debate we should actually start raising these questions. I put this one. If you go and speak with colleagues from Africa, they will raise different ones. If you go and speak with colleagues from Latin America, they will raise different ones. COVID-19 for me should be a wake-up call to learn to unlearn, as Solsanov and Mignolo claim, to learn to unlearn what? That we are actually need to get out of this matrix that we are working and to think that we have a solid argument and ignoring that there are other ways, other, other form, epistemological ways to understand the same um, phenomenon, to move from this utopia that we used to work, that actually in many ways drove to nightmares, okay, forms of nightmares, to what we might call as heterotopia, as we using the concept of Boventura Sosa Santos. Heterotopia works from the center to the margin, okay, decentralizes, <clears throat> understands that we have different centers, we have a multiplicity of centers affecting by the same uh, uh, aspect, okay. And, and, uh, and, 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 and admits that um, the situation is so tragic, okay? That as Eagleton says, the image that we have about the future is that we are failing on the present. We have a failure present and we don't know how to get out of this. And we keep spinning and we keep spinning. Meanwhile, in our schools, the epistemicide keeps being replicated and multiplied, okay? So I would argue that, um, uh, excuse me, uh, we need to understand um, that COVID-19 should be seen as an opportunity um, also to show another evidence of how um, we need to um, um, look for different ways, um, as some decolonial scholars claim, and anti-colonial scholars, look for alternative ways to think the world and to think the way we exist and we think and we do things alternatively, differently. 
Um, Anti-colonial and decolonial scholars have um, a claim that I think it's unbeatable. There is no social difference. There is no social justice without cognitive justice. People think cognitively different. People are not cognitively inferior or superior. They're different. And we have to respect that difference and that diversity. What we need, I claim, and what I think COVID-19, unfortunately, is helping us, could help us doing that, is to um, reinforce the need of this now theory momento that I'm claiming, uh, which implies an alter theory, which implies theory now. We don't, we don't, that's the problem. We need theory for now. Theory is becoming, I think, Henry, especially Henry lately, one of his arguments is this anti-intellectualism that we are living. This intellectualism that's becoming, to be intellectual is to be anti-intellectual, okay? We need theory now, like more than ever before, because we're walking away, teachers and pedagogues and schools of education are walking away from that theoretical um, um, sort of uh, cruciality that we need to understand. So I don't know if I address you. I try to complexify all the questions. I'm sorry, it's a tendency. Okay, th this has been very impressive actually to talk about theory. You know, theory is, is the basics, always the basics. And uh, we will start thinking about theory again and uh, while we are thinking about theory, we will do this in the Turkish context, in our education context, in our you know regional context, maybe. This has been very helpful, Joa. Thank you so much, and I'm I'm really impressed what you have talked about, and you you didn't refer to you didn't use the terms neoliberalism capitalism and and you know totalitarian regimes but we understand actually uh, what happened why you didn't mention about them and um, okay now uh, we are about to close uh, as a last question do you have any question to ask, Joa? Sure. No, I mean, it's, um, I want to, <clears throat> the, the, the way, I want to uh, say, actually comment or complexify um, uh, your, uh, some of your comment now, which is, um, of course, I know that we have a fundamental problem. Uh, and the problem that we have now is this, um, latest phase of global capitalism in its neoliberal, uh, with this neoliberal phase. And uh, in fact, neoliberalism became public pedagogy. It's the public pedagogy and it's tough to challenge. My claim is to challenge this beast, we have to actually reconceptualize and to rethink the way we are actually challenging the beast. And for me, it is impossible to destroy this because it's, it's part of this coloniality, uh, impressive, um, uh, sort of uh, matrix as what Quijano called el, colon, el padrón colonial del poder or de poder, which I think that the way to address this is to actually to rethink um, um, the problems we are having and the defeats we had and, 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 and to understand why we are not making it in a world, I think it's, 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 it's very accurate, the question of Sousa Santos in a world that there is so much to criticize why critical theory is not dominant. I don't know one teacher that does not say, I'm preparing my kids for being critical thinkers. Everybody's critical. So if everybody's critical, why critical theory is not dominant? What is wrong with critical theory? That everybody's doing, I don't, I don't, I don't see one teacher in any country I taught that say, I'm against critical theory. I'm going to do banking. I'm going to reinforce Freire's banking concept of education. I'm against Freire. Everybody's Freire. Everybody does critical theory. So why critical theory is not dominant? Why? Well, I think we have, we critical theorists, we have to figure out why. We have to figure out, um, and again, I mean, in a way, um, a lot of the work has been done. A lot of the forest has been open. A lot of the field has been clear by we stand on the shoulders of people, at least I, of people like Apple, Henry, Dwayne Eubner, um, like Dwayne Eubner sit on the shoulders of others and so far and so forth. Um, and uh, and um, 
and uh, to, to, to address uh, 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 this beast that we call um, uh, 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 neoliberalism and is creating a devastating impact on education, on teacher education, but also at university level in which what counts is metrics. What counts, is, it, what counts today in a neoliberal university is not if Fatima produced a great piece, is where she actually published that because it counts with metrics. How many people is quoting you? How many people is citing you? Well, I mean, um, uh, uh, I would uh, say, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Michael Young, The Rise of Meritocracy, not Michael F. D. Young, Michael Young. Michael Young is an economist that wrote a book, The Rise of Meritocracy. Uh, for those who didn't read, I recommend reading. It's, it's one of the semi, it's one of sort of important books in certain schools of economy. Uh, Michael Young wrote this book and, um, and um, he sent the book to publishers. This uh, is um, what I'm telling you is on the introduction of the book written by his own pen. He sent the book to several publishers and all the publishers trashed the book. No one wants to publish the book. Remember, the book is the rise of meritocracy. It's about meritocracy. So all the publishers, so well-known publishers that you and I know, many well-known publishers that you and I know, refused to publish the book because it was rubbish. So one day, it was actually on the Sunday, I believe it was Sunday, he was walking on the beach with a friend. They were talking about trivial issues. And the friend said to Michael, so did you finish your book? Yes, I did. So where is it going to get published? Well, I'm, I'm not going to get published because I'm, I sent already to several major, major publishers. And they just trashed the book. What do you mean they trashed the book? They, they trashed, they said it's trash, makes no sense. I'm not going to publish. And his friend said, no, 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 wait a minute. I know your thought, I know you're a sharp guy. Do you have the book? Yes, listen, my wife has this Mickey Mouse printer in the garage. Bring the copy, we will print, we will do kind of a family sort of a publication and we'll distribute among friends and let's take it from there. The book is translated in 70 languages. It's one of the books or one of the readings in the School of Economics in Chicago. And there's two chapters about education. So the rise of meritocracy, one of the Bible of meritocracy was published following zero meritocratic metrics and protocols and process and procedures constructed by the system. And this story is actually mentioned in introduction of the book that he wrote and he mentioned the publishers. And one of those, some of those publishers are very well-known publishers. So the title is The Rise of Meritocracy from 1959. It's not from the last century. It's not from the 19th century. It's just around the corner, basically. Written by Michael Young. He has two chapters about education and explains the fallacy of meritocracy. So, and this is this doctrine that neoliberalism imposes on us, okay, that... I think that for us to deconstruct, we have to go and work and, and, uh, and sit face to face as anti-colonial and decolonial scholars claim. We need to sit face to face with other epistemological perspectives to understand how we're going to tackle this. Instead of, um, if, as we say in Africa, if you lost your keys in a specific, Um, there's this say that this guy uh, was looking for the keys underneath the pool and the friend said, Why are you, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my keys. So, so where did you lose your keys? Well, I lost my keys over there. So why are, you looking for keys? why are you looking for your keys over here? Because I have lighting. So this defines um, that we have to actually look for the problem. Um, um, as, as, as Chomsky claims, Uh, um, in, the, in the pursuit of education, of public education, as Chomsky claims, um, uh, 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 the, the, the Nobel Prize of Biology, the Nobel Prize of Biology, if you won, or someone that wins the Nobel Prize of Biology, he didn't win the Nobel Prize because he is aware of all the articles, all the metrics, all the citations that is at a specific library about biology. 
he won the Nobel Prize because he knew what he was looking for. He knew it. And after he understand and define what he was looking for, he knew how he could actually tackle the problem. That's my claim here. That's my claim here. Yeah, very important. Very important, okay. It's, it's been a very, very sharp closing. Sure, thank you. Thank you for this. You're very welcome. And it seems that we will be together uh, in the near future again. Hope so, hope so. Anxious, hope so. Let me know. Thank you so much. It's been very helpful You're to very start welcome. thinking again and to start maybe moving forward. Thank you so much. Okay. You're very welcome. Uh, Eda? I would like to say thank you again uh, to Professor Kiveskiva and all the participants. Um, as I shared on the chat box, I can actually take your comments now. Uh, we heard from um, and uh, they say thank you very much for informative and valuable meeting. And uh, the comments are now uh, coming from our uh, participants, Nebeyram Mizkaja says thank you, and um, Taylan Ulash says thank you for sharing your perfect theory, Mr. Uh, Joa and Fatma Ajan, they say. So if you have any comments, you can feel free to share it on the chat box. Also, I shared our, you know, social media accounts for the previous, um, you know, recordings of the talks. Mm -hmm. And you can visit our YouTube channel, and uh, we have a group on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, okay. in order to make Global Thursday talks um, more inclusive, we are planning to improve some parts. So if mm -hmm. you wish to support, we have a Patreon page you can visit mm -hmm. and consider. And uh, Muratato says, uh, thank you, it was enlightening. I believe um, this brings us to the end of this meeting. It was a pleasure and it was a pleasure to meet you and thank you everyone. For um, thank you. I, I, would, I would end with a personal note. For me, it was, uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, it was very special for me to be here talking for Turkish colleagues on the personal level. Um, uh, because the last time I was in Turkey was about 20 years ago. It was actually where I get married with my wife. So, so Turkey is a very special country for me in Istanbul. So, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay, come again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, welcome. Yes. You, well, you, you have much. friends here, followers here. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We Good thank night. you our bye-bye. We thank you our participants. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you bye -bye. thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye -bye. See you. Bye-bye, Fatma. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.